meetings every Thursday. Um, join our Facebook group if you're interested in learning more about what we do, and then we go on trips and everything. Lots of fun. Um, you can come find me after the event, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, ben Powell, uh, Dr. Ben Powell is the director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University and teaches in the Rawls College of Business. He's the North American editor of the Review of Austrian Economics, the past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education, a senior economist with the Beacon Hill Institute, and a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Economics and Finance from the University of Massachusetts, and his MA and PhD in Economics from George Mason University. So without further ado, welcome to Ben Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to talk to y'all and to see such a good turnout here. Um, Christian Hansen worked in Waterhead Mills in Massachusetts for about 12 years. It was a factory that processed corduroy, velvet, finished cotton. He worked there for a while. His job was oiling machines, fixing belts on them, and one part of his job was to change over the machines in the later part of the day. During the first part of the day, the machines ran off steam power. After 5 p.m., a number of them were converted over to electric power. On March, March 16th, excuse me, 1920, he was going about his daily routine and 5 o'clock came, and he began converting the machines over. When he threw the switch, the box next to it hadn't been properly grounded. He was hit with 500 volts, 550 volts of electricity and died on the spot. That was in 1920. Shortly thereafter, Leona Gagne began working in Cardinal Shoe Factory in nearby Lawrence, Massachusetts. She worked 10 hour days, sometimes six days a week, for relatively modest pay. As her son put it, the pay wasn't bad for what she was doing, and it helped put him and his brother through school. I knew Leona as an aunt. She was my great grandmother. Christian was my stepfather's great grandfather. I grew up in Haverhill, Massachusetts, a city known as the Shoe City, because it was the leading producer of shoes in the late 19th and early 20th century in the United States. I did my bachelor's at University of Massachusetts at Lowell in the shadows of the Industrial Revolution there. Those places, and Leona and Christian, have a lot in common with third world sweatshop workers today. In the conditions that they toil under, the wages that they're paid, the labor laws that govern them. Today, I'm going to talk mostly about modern sweatshops today, although a lot of it relates to those older ones as well. And I'm going to do a lot of talking about economics and the economic laws governing these situations. This does not mean that at any point I'm advocating profits over people or economic efficiency for its own sake. The end here, the goal, is the welfare of third world workers and potential workers, both now and in the future. What economics does is it tells us that's the science of means and ends. It tells us which means are going to be good for getting the ends that we desire. And it's crucial that we look at these if we want to actually help these people. Now, I know before I got here that there was a bit of controversy, to say the least, about this talk. Uh, I saw the Facebook page and a number of the comments on it. And uh, I see some of you here today and appreciate that somebody else was circulating sweatshop counterpoints. And what I'd like to say is welcome, and I'm very glad that all of you who have been talking about this have showed up to the event, and I look forward to having a dialogue about which means are best at promoting the ends of the welfare of these workers. Um, so thank you for coming, particularly those of you who have been objecting to the talk over the last couple weeks. I look forward to, and we'll leave plenty of time and question and answer, to address different points that you might want to raise. Um, and after all, this is what a university is about, is talking about controversial subjects like this in a productive fashion, which is something that doesn't exactly happen on Facebook, which is why I didn't respond to any posts on Facebook. <laughs> but I'll be happy to respond to questions here. So first we need to define what we're talking about in terms of sweatshops. So the general conditions that they have. Low pay, at least by Western standards. Long working hours, 60 hours in a week is not uncommon. Uh, sometimes even 70. Uh, health and safety risks. So it could be fibers in the air that give long-term disabilities or it could be the safety conditions of being injured while working a machine, uh, and generally other poor working conditions. Cramped quarters, maybe not having emergency equipment on site, maybe having poor uh, evacuation uh, plans set up in case of a fire, short bathroom breaks or limited or no bathroom breaks, ditto for lunch. These are the general characteristics I'm talking about when I'm talking about a sweatshop located in poorer parts of the world. 
There's one type that I'm not talking about today that I condemn, that I think every decent human being condemns, and that's places where they literally used forced labor, where workers are brought there under the threat of being coerced with violence, either by the employer or by the government on that employer's behalf. Those, I don't think, benefit workers, and I think are morally outrageous that we should all protest. The type I'm talking about today are places that have all of these bad conditions. So this is not a talk of, well, sweatshops really aren't that bad. No, they really are that bad in terms of things that people say go on at them. But the key point about the ones I'm talking about are they're places where workers choose to work, admittedly from a bad set of other options. But still, the fact that they're choosing that option among a set of bad options is important. I think it's important both ethically, but importantly for us here, in terms of the consequences when we advocate other policies. Because if they're choosing that among a bad set of options, we have to be darn sure that things that we do in the name of advancing the welfare of third world workers doesn't take away the least bad option they have. You make people better off by getting them more options, not by limiting their options. So that's what we need economics to investigate and say, what's going to happen as we advocate for different policies? Is it going to take away this least bad option? So the anti-sweatshop movement is a diverse group. Uh, AFL, CIO, and Unite have been longtime players in it, and were key to getting the student movement started, actually. Uh, it was a union summer program that got a lot of the United Students Against Sweatshop Labor going. I'll take questions at the end of the talk, unless it's just like a clarification point. Okay, well you said, I, no, never mind. Okay, you're first on the list at the end of the talk. Um, <clears throat> United Students Against Sweatshops that have campuses that have started at Duke University has since spread across the country. Uh, anyway, various groups, and all of them are a little bit different in what they advocate for, but there's kind of a core of things that most of them support, which is either a legal minimum or living wage, so a living wage being tied to some sort of local cost of living index, uh, improved safety and working condition, uh, usually through laws or regulations that are going to be enforced by the governments, uh, unionization for the workers, uh, enforced labor laws, so a lot of the labor laws that are currently being ignored in these countries, and uh, bans against using child labor. Uh, this isn't universal for every group, but that's kind of the core that most of them tend to gravitate for. Uh, this uh, one graduate student from Ohio State who is a member of United Students Against Sweatshop Labor, as she kind of, well, not so eloquently put it, uh, everybody wants to have a living wage, everyone wants to be able to take care of themselves and their family, everybody wants to retire, feel good, enjoy life, breathe, live, eat, you know, the regular shit. We're not asking for nothing extra special. Now, the problem here is wishing doesn't make it so. Asking for these things doesn't make it so. We have to identify the mechanisms that are going to generate it without throwing other workers into the worst alternatives. And that's precisely what economics gives us. So the first thing we have to understand is wage determination. So the most that a firm is going to pay an employee. So I'll pick out, so who, who wants to be my sweatshop employer here? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, it basically is. You really should not be that enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> you're my sweatshop, what's your name? John Carlo. John Carlo? Yes, sir. All right. Let's say, and you raised your hand, I'm sorry. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah is a potential worker now. Sorry, you don't get to be the owner anymore. That's okay. She's a potential sweatshop worker. She can create up to $2 an hour in revenue for your firm. What's the most that you're willing to pay her? $2. We did this quickly. Thank you. Some student audiences, we go a long time before we get there. The maximum you're willing to pay her is $2, right? If you have to pay her $2.01 an hour, oh, you're losing money. You're losing one cent every hour she works. Oh, yeah. So we are establishing an upper bound now. This is the most that he's willing to pay Sarah. Now, do you want to pay her that much? Depending on what she gives me. But well, she can I, give I'm you $2 an hour. I'm about to make my money. Would you like to pay her zero? Um, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. then you pocket $2 an Easy. hour in profit oh. each time, right? Maybe. Yeah. But upper bound is basically worker productivity or an econ speak, marginal revenue product of the worker. Mm -hmm. Any higher than that, you're not going to pay it. You're going to unreport it. <clears throat> You'd like to pay him zero. But of course, you can't pay him zero because if he offers you zero, I'm gonna leave. you're going to leave. You're going to go to what? Ever your next best alternative is. Even if it's What's your name? My name's Forrest. Forrest, that's right. I remember you introduced yourself at the beginning. Forrest, you're involuntarily being selected here as a sweatshop employee, an <laughs> employer. <laughs> it, let's say he was going to offer $1.50 in wages. For you to move here, he'd have to offer you better than $1.50, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your lower bound. So these are your two bounds. Upper is worker productivity. Lower <coughs> is their next best alternative. Or econ speak again, it's their opportunity cost. So if we want to do things that get the workers better options, we need to be doing things that move these bounds up. If we're doing something that's not moving one of these bounds, 
then we're risking mandating a pay range that doesn't fall within there and ends up throwing them into worse alternatives because he closes up shop or chooses to hire fewer of the people. Now, either boundary can help. So part of this is the process of competition. You don't want just Nike in town. You want Reebok in town bidding against Nike so you push the wages up that way. That's addressing that lower bound so it's not literally tilling in the soil for subsistence agriculture or going to work for the factory. That gives you a bigger gap between the bounds. When it's two factories competing, that boundary gets a lot smaller. But when we look across countries, about 85% of the variation in wage rates across countries is explained by productivity differences. That means the lion's share of this game is moving the upper bound, doing things that make the workers more productive. And I should say, things that make the workers more productive that might be no fault of the employee on their own. Someone with the exact same human capital skill set working in one situation can have a much higher upper bound than someone in another. In fact, one of the things in the countries where these sweatshops are located is bad government policies and institutions that are making the risk-adjusted uh, expected value of hiring that employee lower, and it's limiting their upper bound through no physical fault of their own. Uh, but either way, these are the things that we have to be addressing. Now, one response to this sometimes is, yeah, but look at these companies make huge profits. Why can't we just take some of this out of profits? In fact, one thing people say, listen, it's not like Nike's. If we just tell Nike that they have to pay an extra 50 cents per shoe, an extra dollar per shoe in labor cost, it's not like they're going to go out of business and choose not to make shoes anymore. Well, of course, that's absolutely right. But Nike doesn't face that choice. Nike makes trade-offs on the margin of how much additional labor do I want to use, how much additional machinery do I want to use, what mix of labor between high-skilled and low-skilled labor do I want to use, more highly-skilled, more productive labor, or more low-skilled, inexpensive labor. And when we do things that make the low-skilled, inexpensive labor more expensive for them, that changes their calculus on this. Now they say we want to remix this. They don't say we're not going to make shoes anymore. They say we're going to make fewer shoes in poor Asian countries, more shoes in maybe more productive Latin American countries, or maybe in really higher productive countries that are in the West that have much more productive workers. So these trade-offs, just identifying a huge pool of profits, doesn't cut it. Because the employers don't all of a sudden become charities who want to give away their profits. They're still trying to work to maximize their profits. That's the world we live in. So conditional on that behavior, we have to look at how they're going to respond when we do things that make the cost of that cheap labor more expensive. This isn't to say, by the way, that these workers are going to permanently have to have low wages. As they become more productive, firms voluntarily are happy to pay them more because they're making more money in return off of them. So it's not cheap labor you're doomed to stay in, and if we raise the price of it, it goes away. It's no part of the process of development that I'll talk about in a little bit that brings up these wages. Uh, but the main point here is it just doesn't jump out of huge profits. So when we think about things that activists advocate for and how it affects these boundaries, and I'm going to do, do some of these and come back to more of them as I go on here. But the first, minimum and living wages. If you mandate one that's higher than the upper bound, you're throwing workers out of a job and back into potentially worse alternatives. It might be the case you say, well, look, there's a gap between the upper and lower bound. We'll get a minimum wage in that hits somewhere in that gap. And that might sometimes happen for some workers, no doubt about it. The point is also, of course, 85% of the variation is that upper bound, so you can only do so much with trying to target inside that gap. But within that, just because you hit it so that it helps some workers, what's going to happen then is if firms have been trying to maximize profits, they were keeping adding laborers right up to the last one was barely contributing to profitability. Any minimum wage effective enough to help a few workers is also going to unemploy other ones and throw them into these worse alternatives. So there's no free lunch in this. So even if you are lucky enough to get in those bounds and not overshoot it, you're still throwing a portion of workers into worse alternatives. Labor standards, they can meet it one of two ways. So it could be something that raises the cost of their labor so they want to use less of it. If that's the case, analysis isn't much different than what I just talked about in terms of the minimum wage. <laughs> Flip side is they might remix the compensation package towards higher standards but lower wages. I'll talk about that in a few more minutes. Boycotts, when people don't like what the company's doing. How does a boycott affect these upper and lower bounds? Downward, right? All of a sudden, the demand for the product just went down. If the demand for the product went down, what happens to the value the individual workers created? It just went down through no fault of their own. You've dropped their upper bound of what they could be paid. 
not a good way. And I will say, to the credit of most anti-sweatshop groups, most of them have moved away from boycotts that they were more in favor of in the late 1990s. Fewer of them advocate this now, and even the ones who do usually say it's their, quote, last resort. Um, so that's been an improvement. Now, the question is, how bad are these alternatives? So there was a group, uh, when this controversy really started to take off in the early 2000s, uh, a group of international trade economists came out and wrote letters to university presidents across the country. And what they said is, you know, don't give way to the student movement. If you ban sweatshop products from your bookstores, you're going to make these third world workers worse off. Uh, and the evidence they cited was that multinational firms pay more than domestic firms in third world countries. True enough. It sparked this group of scholars against sweatshop labor to circulate a letter responding to them. And the basic point that they made was that while it's true multinationals pay higher than domestic firms in third world countries, that's not the situation of how most sweatshop garments are made. Most sweatshop garments aren't made by Nike, Walmart, pick your brand here in the United States, but they're made by as domestic subcontractors who then sell them to the multinational. So they said basically the evidence you're citing just doesn't tell us that these jobs are better than the other alternatives for the people in these countries. Which actually is how I got interested in this topic, because it was about that time I had a, a graduate, uh, undergraduate student even, uh, David Scarbeck was his name, he's a professor in England now. Uh, and he was in my international trade class and we started talking about this and uh, when he started as a term paper with me, we ended up developing into a journal article where we compare then sweatshop wages in third world countries to other available alternatives. Uh, prior to that, no one had done it because there is no nice, neat database of sweatshop countries. And economists are kind of lazy. They like to download nice, neat databases and then do things with them. Uh, but this involved assembling a new data set that didn't really exist because what makes a sweatshop? We can list the conditions, right? Low pay, poor working conditions. But where's like the dividing line? Of like, okay, that's just low wage manufacturing, that's a sweatshop. It's blurry. There are people who try to give different definitions of it. But what we encountered then as researchers doing this, if we make up our definition, we're setting up ourselves for, well, you only got the results you did because you picked the definition in a way that suits you. So what he and I did on this um, is we said, well, let's look at what sweatshop protesters call sweatshops. Whatever the people who are angry about sweatshops call a sweatshop, I'm pretty willing to believe that's a sweatshop. Um, so and this was nice having a research assistant working with me on it. Uh, he combed the newspapers from 1995, I think, uh, until 2003 when we were doing that paper. I've since updated it. I have a book coming out with the same title of this talk within the year. Um, and I've updated it through 2010 now. Of all instances and in major news sources where you see people protesting sweatshops and saying what the wages were in them. So we took that and categorized it so we could systematically look at how they compare it to alternatives. Because prior to that, what a lot of economists and other commentators would do is they kind of just compare a sweatshop job to a single alternative. So like this, in Cambodia where people scavenge from metal cans, plastic, and bits of food in a trash dump, talks about one worker who earns 75 cents a day for her efforts and says for her the idea of being exploited in a garment factory working only six days a week inside instead of seven days in the sun for up to $2 a day is a dream. Uh, this is Nicholas Kristof, by the way, the columnist at the New York Times. Uh, and this is the type of comparisons people would make. Oh, this really bad working in a trash dump compared to two bucks that you can get in a sweatshop. Uh, the normal alternatives to sweatshops or manufacturing in general in these countries, a lot of time it's subsistence agriculture, sometimes begging, informal sector work. Um, but we wanted to do a more systematic one. And in fact, one of the things that, that got a lot of headlines in the 1990s was the Kathy Lee Gifford episode. Some of you might be familiar with this. Our, uh, Charlie Kiernigan, the president of the National Labor Committee, went down to Honduras and got Wendy Diaz, a 15-year-old girl who was working in a sweatshop producing Kathy Lee's clothes. She worked for 31 cents an hour. He brought her onto her television show and confronted her and said, look at you're exploiting this poor girl, paying her only 31 cents an hour. Kathy Lee, of course, bursts into tears and says, oh, I'm going to stop. I won't do this anymore. Um, but nobody made the right comparisons. They were comparing 31 cents an hour to U.S. alternatives. There, it's $967 a year, or translating into roughly about $2.75 per day. How does that compare with Honduran living standards? At the time, more than 15% lived on less than $1 per day. Nearly 30% lived on less than $2 a day. Her annual income was 37% higher than the average in that country. And she's a 15-year-old girl. This is not the job in Honduras that we want to be protesting. We want to be upset about the horrible living standards that many people in Honduras toil under, but getting rid of 
Wendy Diaz's job is not one of the jobs that you want to get run. So this is just a sample of n equals 1. So let's look at more of these, which is what Dave and I did. So as I mentioned, we searched LexisNexis for the news articles for this. Uh, the data often comes from union activists or anti-sweatshop activists, instead of the one protesting the sweatshop and saying what the wage is. Is this the best, most accurate source of wage data? Probably not. But if these are the people who are saying the sweatshops are bad, if they have any incentive to pick out either the newest worker who's not representative of the normal workers at that factory, or use the most unfavorable exchange rate calculations when they turn it into dollars, or whatever, it's going to lead to them understating how bad the, excuse me, understating what compensation at those factories is. Which means if I'm gonna to try to show you that it's good relative to living standards in these countries, that makes my case harder. So if there's a bias in the data, it cuts against what I'm trying to say here. The, oh, this is the face of some of the sweatshop employers that we identified as we were reading the news sources. So Mary Kate and Ashley, Walmart, I already mentioned Kathy Lee. I thought that was P. Diddy, but when I gave another box, some people <laughs> told me it that I was wrong. Um, I just Googled P. Diddy images and who is it? 50 Cent. 50 Cent. So, yeah, so 50 Cent pays his workers more than 50 Cent sickness. Uh, <laughs> this is way too small and blurry on the screen. Uh, <coughs> is the list of individual sweatshops that we found. Uh, so often there was a lot of duplication. You'd see the same thing being reported in a bunch of newspapers. So we'd sort those out so that we had each one being a unique event. You get basically a bunch in Bangladesh, a few in Brazil, uh, Cambodia, a bunch in China, uh, Costa Rica, uh, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Honduras, India more recently, not in the early period, <coughs> Indonesia, and a lot of them in Indonesia are Mikey. Uh, Nike, excuse me. Laos, Mauritius, which is kind of an odd one, I'll explain later. Nicaragua, <laughs> South Africa, Thailand, Vietnam. And the, the wages varied. Sometimes they were reported monthly, weekly, uh, daily, hourly. Uh, so we converted them all into annual income. It didn't tell us how many hours each one of these worked, so we'd have to come up with various estimates for how many hours you work in a sweatshop that I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, but here's kind of a baseline to compare it to. So controlling for purchasing power, by the way. So the differences in purchasing power of a dollar across different countries. So some countries are cheaper to live in than others. Controlling for that, the percent of the population that lives under $1.25 and under $2 a day, which is kind of your international poverty standards that the World Bank and other organizations use. When we look at this list of countries, in a lot of them we see huge segments of the population living under less than $1.25 or $2 per day. Uh, some of them a little bit better, particularly in Latin America, Costa Rica, uh, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, uh, uh, Brazil also, a little bit lower. Keep those in mind. So Bangladesh being the worst of the bunch, over 80% of the people over this time period living under $2 per day. So what we did is we took all of these sweatshop wages, <coughs> also converted them for purchasing power parity and averaged them across the countries. How does it compare to these poverty standards? So sweatshop earnings per day assuming a 60-hour work week, and all of them make it above the $2 a day threshold, even in Bangladesh. Some of them, remember Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, those were the places where <coughs> there weren't so many people under that standard. But look at the wage they're getting in the sweatshop there. 10, almost 12, and in one case about $17 per hour, excuse me, per day. Considerably higher than these poverty thresholds. Uh, but in all of the countries, making it up there. Now, of course, this isn't the goal. We don't want just above the poverty threshold. We want them to be better than that. Uh, but as a baseline, when we see huge sections of these countries impoverished, this is saying something about the sweatshop jobs not being the bad ones in that country, uh, or at least not being the really bad alternatives. After all, there's a reason workers choose to work in them. We can also take the next step and compare it to average incomes. So just like we did with Wendy Diaz when we looked compared to poverty standards, next we can look towards average incomes. Here, the story is a little bit less dramatic. So I give you for each country four estimates, 40, 50, 60, and 70 hours per week. In general, it's probably the 60 hour a week estimate that's most accurate or most representative of sweatshop work, maybe in some cases 70 or in some cases 50. Uh, you see in a number of countries, so this is the 100% line. Anytime you hit this, working in the average sweatshop that's been protested in these countries over this period of time results in them earning the same as the average income for the whole country. Uh, Notice, by the way, a lot of these countries have very skewed income inequality. 
So average income is in some ways a tough standard. It's not saying the median person in society's earnings, since in some of these countries you have a few very wealthy elite and then massive impoverished people. Uh, but in any case, it's still our standard we're going to use. And in a lot of them, it's significantly above 100%. In a number of them, they're kind of like the normal jobs. So in the 70 to 100% range of average income, as we're looking there on Indonesia, India, El Salvador, pretty much. Dominican, it's getting up around 70%. Costa Rica, just over 100 There's a few exceptions here that I'm sure some of you have noted. But when you look at them further and see what's going on in these exceptions, the main answer is immigration. So Brazil, way below average. What was the article actually about? Illegal immigrants from Bolivia working in a sweatshop in Brazil. They didn't have access to the other opportunities in Brazil. Of course, we did, could and did, take the wage then in Bolivia and compare it to what the immigrants were earning in Brazil. And what you find is they're earning the factors above the average income in Bolivia. Ditto, when we come over here to some of these in Thailand, not in South, Af uh, not in South Africa, I'll come back to that one. Mauritius in particular was people from Sri Lanka, uh, India, and Bangladesh who had immigrated there. Again, compared to the incomes in those other countries, it's significantly higher with, than what they were earning. Um, China is on a little bit on the low side. Here, there were a couple stories of immigration from other countries, but the main one is internal migration in China. Income inequality between Chinese provinces is huge. So a lot of what you see for sweatshop workers in China are working in coastal provinces where incomes are higher, but they're from very poor inland provinces. They move there, they work in the factory for a few years, they save their earnings, they go back to where they're from, and then buy uh, smaller businesses or build houses for themselves and stuff, and they go back there. So a lot of it, if you compared it to the available alternatives of where they were in their province to where they went, the story would look a lot more like the other ones. Uh, South Africa is the one exception. The story there was about an urban minimum wage being enforced in a rural area. When the government came to enforce it, the workers at the firm actually rioted and attacked the government authorities who showed up there, presumably because they understood it would cost them their job. So, general picture here is these sweatshop jobs, the very ones we're picking out for protest, by the way, relatively better than most of the alternatives. So while U.S. cartoonists might draw things like this, where you have the small-brained sweatshop employer saying, look on the bright side, no one will bug you for your paycheck. If you're going to mug someone in these countries who's not a tourist anyway, these workers would be good candidates compared to the poverty that a lot of other people are living in. Some people will say, okay, I understand sweatshops often pay better than the alternatives. In fact, I debated a woman uh, from a labor relations council before. Uh, and in the debate, I was actually very surprised because it was two student groups on campus. The economics club, I think it was, invited me, and the group associated with the anti-sweatshop movement invited her to debate me. And in the opening, what she said was, I'm willing to concede right away that the wages in these sweatshops are better than the other available alternatives. And I was like, wow. Which, actually, the students who invited her also kind of felt like, wow, because they weren't <laughs> expecting that either. Um, and what she wanted to make it then was a focus on just the working conditions. She says, we have to accept market forces for wages, but no one should have to work with these horrible, risky, dangerous working conditions. So what determines the mix of compensation then? So my sweatshop employer, let's say you have to pay Sarah a buck eighty, an hour, a, buck eighty a day in order to get her to work for you. Do you care if you pay her a dollar eighty in money, or if you pay her a dollar in money and eighty cents worth of safer working conditions, health insurance, vacation time, whatever? No, it's the same dollar eighty. Same dollar eighty. A cost is a cost is a cost, right? Mm -hmm. To some extent, actually, you might prefer a little bit of health and safety if it makes her more productive. Oh, absolutely. Life, right. But other than that, controlling for that factor, you don't care. Do you care? I don't know how bad it is. I chose to be there, so it's like, you know, if it's bad, then I can Yeah, it, if it is bad, <laughs> you can leave. But, so there's a given total compensation you're going to get, right? A buck 80. Do you care how it's divided up between things? Do you have a job right now? Yeah. Where, where do you work now? Or no, it's temporary. Temp that's, yeah. that's okay, it counts. Okay. Where do you work? Uh, bookstore. The bookstore. If the bookstore came to you and said, we're going to cut your wage in half, but we are going to have really cool computers and a comfy desk chair and all these other nice perks for you to sit in while you're here that are worth the same amount of money. Would you care? Yeah, I want the money. You want the money. Okay. Basically, employees, whether it's Sarah in her job right now or a third world worker or someone anywhere else, they care about the mix of compensation. 
And depending how wealthy they are and what their total compensation is, might affect <clears throat> that basket of how they want it split up. If you take people who are desperately poor in third world countries, how do you think they want most of their compensation? They want the money because they're desperately trying to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves and their family. As a result, they're willing to bear lots of risk and take unpleasant working conditions. This kind of changes the perception of what's going on now. Is it the evil company who's giving them bad working conditions? No, the company really doesn't care. They care about the total compensation. That's limited by our bounds that we talked about. Once we establish where we're giving the compensation, how that's divided up. They don't care, employees care. That means they have every incentive to tailor that mix towards employee benefits. <coughs> if they don't, they're paying too much for the workers they're getting. They could remix the compensation and pay less and keep the employees equally happy. Profit maximizing firms want to tailor it towards worker preferences. The response might be, of course workers want better conditions. Yes, of course they do. Uh, Bruce is sitting here. He works here at Florida State University. Bruce Benson, some of you probably know him or have had him as a professor. Would you like better working conditions? Absolutely. And this is coming from a guy who's on sabbatical right now. <laughs> we always want better conditions. Now if I asked him, would you like better conditions and less pay, I don't think I'm going to get the same answer. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> so unfortunately what people often do is say, well, workers want better conditions. In fact, they'll go to them and say, would you like better conditions? Yes, they say yes. Of course, every worker is going to say yes. But that doesn't give you the trade-off. Would you like better conditions if we compensate on some other margin? Uh, so that's actually what I did um, for two firms in Guatemala. I picked them out specifically because the National Labor Committee had targeted them and had various complaints about the working conditions of these firms, uh, citing inadequate pay, long working hours, generally poor working conditions, they weren't following Guatemalan law in giving them mandated health insurance or mandated vacation time. They were often verbally abusive. Um, there were actually three firms in Guatemala that were textile firms that had been protested by the NLC, but one of them was already out of business before I could conduct the survey. So when I went down there, this picture is actually on a second visit because I didn't get the factory's permission to talk to the workers. And as you look at me, I might kind of stand out if I'm around trying to talk to workers anyway. <laughs> so I hired a local Guatemalan firm to go out and survey workers as they were leaving the factories or before they were going in the factories without the company's permission. Because one problem is, if you get company permission, then they want to control possibly who you interview with, or the employees are just generally intimidated by the situation, whatever. We don't want that bias in the data. So we just surveyed them on our own. Now it doesn't give you a perfect you know, scientific random sample, but there was no conscious selection mechanism we were using. We were trying to survey them at random as possible without getting picked up by the factory for doing so. Um, and then later on, I actually went down for a site visit to follow up and talk to the management and ask them questions kind of like I was posing to you, which was bizarre to them. They were like, why is this guy from the United States asking me about sweatshop stuff and not like verbally abusing me and protesting me? Um, but this is inside the factory there. And it's really convenient that I had a sweat stain, but that was actually from the drive there. The factory was, <laughs> the factory was actually ventilated. Um, anyway, so I asked them these questions going down the NLC list of complaints. Here are the different ones. Are you willing to work for lower pay if your employer reduced the number of hours you have to work, made your hours more predictable, gave you more bathroom breaks, gave you longer lunch breaks, made your working conditions more pleasant, made your working conditions safer, provided health insurance, gave you paid vacation, treated you more fairly, reduce the risk of sexual harassment. If we just go over the total between the two firms, <clears throat> no, 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 no. The thing that got the most agreement was vacation time, and still 81% of the people did not want that. I did on the survey have a second question for them, which was, if yes, how much? But given the responses, that part became kind of irrelevant. What was the sample size? Uh, sample size was 35 workers at each firm. Uh, so that was about 10% of the employees in one and uh, a little less than 5% of the employees, I think, in the other one. In the uh, genders, did you say that? Uh, gender mix was about, it, was, it wasn't half and half, but it wasn't far off. I'm going to say about 58% women, 42% uh, men. Uh, the paper is published in Comparative Economic Studies, the journal. So if you Google it, you can get the exact thing there because I break down the descriptive statistics and stuff there. I just don't know off the, the top of my head. Um, and there was like four people, five people total out of that sample that had some sort of supervisory look role. When you knock them out of the sample, it doesn't really change anything very much. Uh, we cut it a few different ways and break it all down in the article. This is just kind of a money shot from it. Um, so, 
as I'm telling you these things, I'm actually looking at the sheet sweatshop's point counterpoint that was handed out when I came in here. And the first one kind of deals with this, of the wages being better than alternatives, working conditions being better than alternatives. And it says, sweatshops are better than the alternatives, i.e. child prostitution, scavenging, begging. Then the facts below that, the fact that was the fact that the worst fates, that, that there are worse fates than sweatshops is not an argument in their favor of exploiting working conditions. It was painfully clear in Bangladesh in November 2012 that sweatshops were the worst alternative for the 112 workers who died in a factory fire. Of course, for those 112 workers, ex post, that is a worse outcome than pretty much any other one they could have gone into. But this does nothing to tell us that ex ante going into these things, they aren't a better alternative for people. Actually, the equivalent of this argument would be to say, here's someone whose house burned down and they died in their house fire, Therefore, people will be better off dwelling in caves than moving into houses. That just doesn't flow from one to the other. Um, next, how about save the children? <coughs> okay, this might be cool for adults, but we've got to keep kids out. No one wants to see kids working. Well, why do children work? It's not because their parents are mean. It's not because the kids really want to. They work because their families are desperately poor and they need the income the kids can provide in order to get by. The alternatives for these children, much like the adults, are much worse when you take away this option. So in 1993, Congressman Tom Harkin proposed banning imports from Bangladesh because of child labor. In response, a number of factories fired, off, fired their children employees. Oxfam did a study and found that many of them became, as this thing points out, prostitutes or starved. This is clearly worse alternatives for children. Uh, again, let's go to the more general case instead of just the specific one then. Oh, so this is, by the way, just a, this is Guatemala. I've been down to Guatemala a bunch of times. Uh, this was coming off a volcano. I used my economics to subsidize my hiking, too. So I was coming off a volcano here, and this was on the lower slopes of it. Uh, it was a Thursday morning, so it's not like the weekend, and they're working on the family farm here. A couple kids working in agriculture. They're probably eight, nine years old. This is the common form of child labor around the world. It's not working in factories. So where do children work? So we can look at the same set of countries where we found sweatshops. Uh, agriculture is where the highest percentage of working children are, followed usually by services. Sometimes services leads it, but like domestic